All right. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'm Quentin Ring, and I am the director of Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center. On behalf of Beyond Baroque, I wanted to welcome you to a special talk and reading with three exceptional artists and poets, Celeste Goyer, Holiday Mason, and Jim Cushing. The three are members of the Wild Orchid Collective, an interdisciplinary artist group based in Venice, California, and have worked together on collaborative poems, collage, sound art, and video since 2014. The focus of this evening's, this evening's program is on Only a Few Yards Away, a virtual art show that the Mike Kelly, Mike Kelly Gallery at Beyond Baroque is hosting on our website. It includes collage and painting by Celeste, photography by Holiday, and wall text by Jim. I'm thrilled to host the show, uh, especially as it's National Poetry Month. It feels like a natural fit to have uh, really just some beautiful arts uh, produced by some truly talented poets. Um, in just a moment, uh, they'll talk a little bit about the show and read some poems, uh, but I wanted to say a few more words of introduction about Beyond Baroque uh, itself. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge Beyond Baroque's presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and the violent dispossession of their land. Um, before we get started as well, I wanted to say a few words uh, specifically about Beyond Baroque. We are, as most of you know, a literary space located in Venice, California. We are dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language through cultivating new writing and presenting contemporary literature and art. Um, for the time being, our programming remains entirely online, um, although we do hope to make some plans to reopen shortly. Um, we have a variety of workshops coming up. Uh, these include a one-day masterclass with the poet Bridget Bianca. Uh, that starts tomorrow, actually, so if you want tickets to that, please uh, purchase them right away. Uh, we have a six-week course on the literary submission process with Sochi Hulisa Bermejo, and we have a workshop focused on Ramadan uh, with the poet and activist Tanzila Ahmed. Uh, additionally, we have our ongoing free weekly, weekly workshops. Uh, Wednesdays, we have the, uh, our free poetry workshop. Currently, that's with Beth Ruscio through the end of this month, starting in May. Uh, it will be taught by Louis Resto. Uh, and on Mondays, we have our fiction workshop with Raquel Baker. Uh, please do check all of those out. Uh, the link will be in the chat. Um, and you can also find them on beyondbaroque.org. Um, in addition to our workshops uh, for National Poetry Month, uh, we've partnered with the LA Times Festival of Books Poetry Stage to produce 17 poetry videos. Uh, those are up at the LA Times Festival of Books uh, website. Um, it's really fabulous poets uh, that include Yusef Komenyaka, uh, Gail Ronsky, Martha Ronk, and several, several others. So please do check those out. They're fantastic. Um, finally, we have upcoming on May 6th, uh, our virtual benefits beyond this moment. Uh, this is a fundraiser intended to help us make repairs to our space in preparation for our reopening. Uh, beyond Baroque is a landmark, landmark space that has nurtured generations of writers and artists. Um, those include variously Wanda Coleman, The Band X, Mike Kelly, uh, Amy Gersler, as well as uh, the United States' youngest ever inaugural poet, Amanda Gorman, uh, who got her start here in our workshops um, really just a few years ago. Um, Amanda will be joining us for the fundraiser, as well as Amy Gersler, um, and also Pulitzer Prize winner Tahinda Jess, uh, the founder of one of the founders of Los Lobos, Louis, per Louis Perez. MC5 guitarist Dwayne Kramer and many, many others. Um, it's going to be really a really wonderful program. Um, so I would ask all of you um, who are invested in Beyond Baroque and the programming we do, um, please do consider purchasing, purchasing tickets and supporting our space and our programming as uh, we come off the back of just really it's been a bit what's been a very difficult year um, for all kinds of art spaces, uh, most especially including Beyond Baroque. Um, our programming has always been marked by a sense of uh, interdisciplinary exploration. Um, that's one reason I'm thrilled to have Holiday, Celeste, and Jim here tonight. Um, they're talented across multiple media. Um, I think they put together a, a really wonderful exhibit and, and also a great talk and reading uh, this evening for you. Um, I do encourage you to check out the exhibits online. Um, you know, after the show, just poke around it a little bit. Um, but finally, before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit more about, uh, about our featured artists. Uh, Holiday Mason is a poet and photographer based in Venice. Her fine art photography and portraits focus on the beauty of aging and humans as a part of nature. Uh, images in the exhibit were selected from thematic series, including The Red Veil, Yoni Cronecloud, 
Nighty Dancer and Things on the Ground. She's the author of two chapbooks and five full-length collections of her poetry. Celeste Goyer is a poet and self-taught artist based in Los Angeles. Her abstract and figurative works are rendered mostly in acrylics with collage, sculptural assemblage, and photography also in the mix. Celeste's artwork, artwork and poetry have been published in print and online journals. James Cushing's most recent full-length poetry collection is Solace from Kanga Press. He was a PhD from UC Irvine and was the San Luis, San Luis Obispo Poet Laureate in, 20, in 2009 to 2011. He is also a visual artist. Um, I'll also say they are very, all three of them are very dear friends to Beyond Baroque and really just wonderful human beings. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Celeste Holiday and Jim. Uh, Celeste, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to introduce the program more fully. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Quentin. Thanks to everybody who joined. Thank you, um, Jimmy, for helping set up the technology here. So uh, Quentin has told you how to find the show. It's on the Beyond the Beyond Baroque website. There's a link. And if you haven't seen it yet, um, you can view it there. We also have a group poem underway that is a collaborative effort where people are joining in with one line each, and then Jim will be editing them. He's actually editing it in an ongoing way. So if you've added a line already, you can check back in and see how, that is, how it's going. And um, if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll uh, have a segment at the end where we'll catch, catch those. The a rough um, idea of how the event will go tonight is that we'll each read from our own work and then we'll read some collaborative poems. And then we'll have a little chat about the artwork and we'll share some images that aren't in the show and chat about our process of collaboration for that. And we'll end with the questions. So uh, we'll begin with Jim and then I'll read and then Holiday will read. So thanks again for joining us. So thank you so much, Celeste. Thank you. Thank you, Holiday. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you everyone in the audience on Zoom and Beyond Baroque. Um, uh, I'm going to read from my book, Solace, and in the spirit of, uh, of collaboration, I'll point out that this photograph on the cover uh, was taken by Holiday Mason, uh, and it's part of her, um, her uh, um, uh, selection called the Urn series. Um, uh, I'd also just like to, um, uh, to say that, uh, that my, my beloved daughter, Iris, was um, awarded a PhD today from the, from the uh, CUNY um, Graduate Center. Uh, for her work on um, on the uh, 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 overlooked and underrated American poets Diane de Prima and Mary Norbert Corte. Uh, I'm going to read some poems from this book and then I'm going to turn it uh, over to, uh, to Celeste. Uh, this is called The Gear That Turns the Sky. How sweet to shrug off childhood to bid farewell to the heroes who botched it. I slipped off the world I used to wear and everything I saw had edges and outlines, colors all their own, red clay, cranberry, cut grass. The sky's unlimited yet striped with tape. This morning I passed judgment on the moon a tiny crescent in a late spring sky. You said I was made of magnesium and boxer shorts. I hid my cupy face behind a volume of Emerson. No one can explain why or how these mornings take the form of a path made of shoes leading up a hill, each shoe recalling a suffering face, wide with grief, or dead, mummified in that screen face position, while other fruits and flowers begin a long, glum fade. This is a prose poem entitled In the Shadow of a Slice of Birthday Cake. Yes, say the elders. It is good to have an older brother, one whose wing you feel cool and strong beneath. For an older brother is an image of the future. Oh, it is good to hear the call of the past, to hear that voice. It is good 
to re-cry tears we shed when our losses were fresh, and to re-laugh at, at what once made us lighthearted. Yet it is also good to see an image of one's possible destiny. And so it is good to have an older brother or one who serves that duty. I was 15 years old, full of how wind falls onto trees and sets loose pods and pebbles of memory, scented with eucalyptus dust or, or dusted with eucalyptus scent, whichever it is. Nothing yet had been heard from the night. I wasn't implicated in any of it. I simply ate my macaroni and red ramparts. No one hurried to save me from anything that went bump or yanked the money chain. She felt ambivalent. Ceilings seemed lower. And while the idea of many small rooms wasn't fundamentally objectionable, these rooms were like storage boxes with connecting aisles, and you were supposed to live and sleep in these boxes, getting from one to another through a system of stairs and catwalks. This is gonna take some getting used to, she said to herself as she lay down next to the coffee maker. But another scary dream shook her awake at 4.15 a.m. and her hands trembled as she lit a cigarette and heated milk in a pan. I remember standing in a dingy wind, looking at the city full of men in black leather and women in red lipstick and tight short dresses, then walking to the lip of the freeway and sticking out my thumb. Night opened its hermaphroditic thighs, which no one can look upon long. That's why the night is dark. And somewhere a bard began his heroic song. I heard the bard's voice as though it came from my own interior, and suddenly raw material of all kinds started pouring out of every socket, speaker, screen, page, and mouth. On stage, actors sucked sugarless, fruit-flavored hard candy and played out their characters' sour Rube Goldberg-ish lives. The set design recalled William Steinberg's fineness of line and offered cryptic explanations of what was supposed to make the cat push, push the tennis ball onto the bird nest, etc., etc., written in an epigrammatic, syntactically puzzling style, too close and too far off to be readable, too important and too trivial to be commented upon. The scene began with wagging fingers and gnomes, fairies, elves, and all of that group hopping in zany motion through green pastures, sheep shit, all of that. Then a tragic hand dropped coffee onto the backs of the assembled like a thunderstorm, and humid electric cling fueled up the air like reggae. I didn't get it at first. An overweight man wearing only a red G-string explained my non-comprehension to me as a consequence of insufficient cream in my diet. You must drink more cream, he said through his red and gray Van Dyke beard. I suddenly felt able to fly. I looked at the face of my old-fashioned watch. The crystal shaped itself into a lens. I looked through it and saw the same man stride confidently across the stage to a piano, sit, and begin playing an Ellington medley. Some stared at his G-string, some at his beard, others simply dismantled their salads. I stretched my legs, my neck, even my fingers, but still heard, even above the piano music, the crackling sound of spring landing on the roof with heavy booted feet. She remembered lying in bed at night alone, half awake, the day's events turning in her mind, fire tales from falling stars visible enough to wish on. The creamy sound of trumpets and trombones guarded the images at the center of her wishes, incohate though they may have been. Some part of them may have come true. Now, she wonders, was she misleading herself all along Everyone she knows smells of dark roasted coffee and lemon cake every time. The predictability is wearing her out. If only someone smelled really, really bad. Yes, say the elders. 
It is good for the young to act foolishly, that they may demonstrate the truth of the proverb and thereby earn the right to learn its wisdom. It is good that kinetic moments be preserved in all their explosive immediacy so that we may come to love their power to frighten and liberate, thrill and heal. It is good to look into a tiger's eye, to fill a truck with your belongings, drive it to a place you've never been and build a new life there. How much of the world's great story moves in just this way, through the foolish beauty of the heart. Thank you. That was called In the Shadow of a Slice of Birthday Cake from the book Solace, uh, published by Kawanga Press. Thanks, Jim. Sure. Royal stains. Scissors, where are you? My hair standing on end. It wants convincing that we're cared about. While we wait, it's taken up felting mice, weaving them tightly to my nape. Anyone can press their thumb on a nail and make a red seed, but even a jewel will sink when blood spills in the throat itself. I'm sure it was our shared blanket, like a thick dust devil that tangled my hair, turning knots into a competition only a decision expert, such as a knife, could win. You owe me a birthday gift of a hair brushing and a pomegranate. Many things are too heavy to carry. They must be worn. Pink petals tied together. The girl ran to the front pages to see where the magnet that made everyone jump was hidden. She wouldn't go home until she was safe, until lilac season wrapped the porches. She wouldn't go home until her sister and brother appeared as people again, came down from the attic where they lived, rolled up, soft and silent as old quilts tied with alligator belts. She wanted her friends to come over to her place to eat, find what was hidden in the sugar bowl, an agenda written to protect all dining rooms from warfare. Her fingers, she believed, corresponded in Japanese to pink petals tied together. She quietly dreamed in owl language of a pony with horns and an old blanket. She'd spend the summer under her sister's bouffant hair, her sister's dark nails, her lips salty and furious. Next poem is Latkes. We work. What we do, we make delicious in soft and unstable layers such as buttermilk. We are ready to offer jam and butter every morning, round, without elbows. Yes, we are round, not rectangular. We go into shadows to find the pink second shadows. Children come to us as easily as various cream sauces from cans. We swing them into soft duvets. Saturdays on carpets or lighted sidewalks, after pouring in some maple butter, we read. We can be sharpened if you kick us. If you push us, we'll write a letter in cursive italics only the very thin should attempt to read. We poke holes in nothing. If you keep showing us that knife, we will swear we'll never meet again. We're busy, come rain, snow, or ice. We are a court, not an elbow. We repair, we repair. We are working on it. And a prose poem called In August, My Name Leans Down. My name is just one of millions, official rephrasings of a death that gleams. The new me must be adequate and continuous, the shoes I will wear in these hills, official gear for riding against ghosts and feeding this large family full of children who need to know the names of things. And who will keep the men under control, organize them with small pie-stained safety tags when August falls downstairs suddenly, chipping a tooth, setting fire to the green banisters. I'm older now, 
I can swim toward any shore I can see without my glasses. Come, sing pizzicato with me. Our afternoons together will be dark and beautiful, full of armchairs we have loved, rolling chairs that have hosted our theatricals. We'll warm the air with our coiled blood. Birth and shopping are gaining on us. I can't afford a thunderstorm, but I'll order one anyway. Two more. Time's supposed arrow has three mouths. <laughs> Dad walks around the garden like someone with cold metal in his mouth, wondering why a flame of light swirls in summertime's blue sky. He can't predict who also waits in his mouth's darkness and who will speak first. Sugar Puff, the world's oldest pony, wants to beat him up for treating kids the way he does. Sugar Puff does beat him up while we watch. The old pony's sooty tail is easily blown by the wind. He grows depressed, knowing the beatings do no good. And the letter O is just another sort of bathtub where we can lose our good watches, un unchanged in shape since the sun appeared on the back of yesterday's money. Dad gets a flashlight to lead the way to his happy and exciting life a flame tattooed around his mouth. And last, errors large and small. I've been piloting this barge since forever, before sugar, before rope, and I admit to a certain accidental mode of navigation that most closely resembles teeth marks on a pitch black dance floor. In this pattern may hide an answer to the inexplicable conundrum of my cargo bulky yet ever shrinking. Still, the fruits are red this year, yes, and the green sky is bright at the top. I reach for a flashlight to show you this part in my miniature diary. You appear to be asleep, but you're somehow still shouting about the soul train dancers. It's just something I have to figure out, you say, writhing and grinding. I'm not exaggerating. You're always looking for ways to celebrate how the weight of years ended its tight-fisted shine on your forehead. Our errors, large and small, are also bright at the top. Yes, brighter than our heads and light green and crisp as a cookie. Thank you. Holiday. I have to follow that, hey? <laughs> Fantastic, both of you. Um, I wanted to right here talk just a little bit about the start of the Wild Orchid Collective and the Wild Orchid Ranch. And um, between, I can't remember, Sarah, you may remember, I see you're here. Um, Sarah McClay lived on the land here with me. And we started to kind of pass poems back and forth and began uh, what turned into uh, the She series of Venice. Oh, she says very late 2007. Okay. The She series of Venice correspondence that was eventually published by our beloved What Books Press, um, which is such a fabulous press here. And so, Sarah and I may have two different re recollections of the beginning, which is part of collaboration. Um, and the book um, beginning in 2007, we were using quotations around the pronouns, he, everything is capitalized. So when I'm reading from the book, um, I'll be doing this kind of madly, but do remember that everything, the I, the she, the he, are all in quotations uh, indicating how things are intermixed and they're superimposed on us, which now is much more of a, a, a popular and necessary concept in the collective. Anyhow, this became the Wild Orchid Ranch and then Celeste and Kush came in and we started, we were shooting photos and it just evolved from there. So the personnel moves in and out, but always 
we are all a part of the wild orchid. I'm going to read a poem I hadn't expected to read, but Cushing's poem uh, triggered it. This from a time when we were in uh, New York City for AWP, it was kind of a blast. Um, and this is a portion of the She series. I'm going to read um, four or five poems from this one little tiny one of Sarah's so you can kind of hear the call and response. Um, these are not woven or braided poems, but it is a collaboration where the, the whole is stronger than the parts, even though we both felt the parts could stand on their own, they were really talking to each other. So number 15, she sees obsidian. Seriously, you can't really be afraid of the rearranged height. I mean, light he says, and offers lemon, yes, pure lemon cake, before guiding her through the almost freezing, expanded, bright hallways of mirrors into the past and into also the dreams of the mad, those glaring portraits of the velveteen desert, a perfect moon cooling the low slung spine of the singing lion, his peaceful breath a storm. He leads her hand over the city, she observes her hand over the city like a finger on a jeweled button, the city, and in the palm of his other hand, a stolen marriage bed. Whistling way down in the streets and the canyons between buildings, afraid of heights? You can't see, seriously? The black crayon twirling descent of decency? She watches the world, no, really, just a single small congested street, so small at the tip of her boot, which is at the fantastic ledge of a building. The people, like insects and pebbles, seem to all be in black, and everyone without their genitals, and also, she thinks, without the moon, without collarbones, and without the haloed hollow moon. 16. At the 23rd floor pane, a raven screeches circles nearly cross-eyed, its metallic gaze whacked and hot, and so seemingly far above the hot pink Gerber daisies, cut short and stuck in a squat drinking glass on the hotel table, she's pulled close to the window to view the huge downtown panorama. What she bought today in the market near the land seller's stand at the corner of 6th and Broadway were these flowers and some punished strawberries, the ruined, hidden for obvious reasons under the beautiful, the perfect, the ripe ones. We do not take ourselves out into public, she thinks, sitting there nude under her too large clandestine coat, her black scarf, her flapping navigator's hat. Now in the liminal cold, the park is indeed central. Each copper rooftop of the city skyline lancing the cerulean sky, indicative that this is the invention of subordination. What is mine is his, is not ours, is not of the unpunctuated sky. They sell real fur coats cheap, and her wrists are poor with poor versions of roses sprayed on at sacks. The clarified trees, they listen to the humans, vertical, vertigo, vain, rough, illiterate shoving. The men here are covered. Men everywhere are covered. Trains like streams of blood go down to the river. I have a list. I do. I need that help. Okay, these are little teeny tiny poems. What? You see? And I'm going to read my number 26 and then Sarah. So 26, holiday. It's deserted, she says. The house, your body, when? When did it happen? He says. Finally, she says, and opens the doors for him. Sarah. 26. 
At the center of this was a dream about a man she couldn't remember in an office she couldn't recall who told her things she did not understand. The speech was garbled. She asked him to repeat what he'd said. It sounded exactly the same. And then the last poem from the She series is my number 27. While going up, she asks the jolly man in the elevator, hey, what's in the cooler? Body parts, he replies. Which ones, she asks. Two left hands and the eye. I mean, an eye, the color of grass. No glass, an emerald rose. But chickens don't fly, she whispers. Then does, leaping out from the penthouse, her nose parting air, sleek as an undone bundle of cherry blooms loosened by wind, by hot sun from the tree limbs, her own skin like fine lingerie, silking before exploding over the ever imploding city, the streets humming like bees and lips moving without sound, or was it sound without meaning, meaning unstrung, but in a good way, she thought later. <laughs> And I just want to, I have no idea. I didn't time myself, so I'm not, I'm going to read a, a couple more things. Um, I want to read a, something that it's not exactly a collaboration, but it would never be a poem if Celeste didn't do something with it. So this is really a series of uh, text messages that I sent. And Celeste calls people that are traveling packages. So the poem, she titled it, The Package Moved Along. And it is a constellation of messages I sent her uh, while traveling, packages en route, gas, car drop off, post mother scrambled eggs and wee apartment, toll roads up. Passing now, gun club road, giant golf ball sculptures passing through is the only possible option. I didn't buy you the chicken bag, though honestly, you could carry it off. It's about the body, food, pain, etc. A lot of driving to her childhood haunts and shopping, short, thoughtfully organized outings, exhausting nonetheless. The red lobster did me in. Um, and then I'm going to close with two new poems, which seem to me to be about collaboration, both the weaving together and the main the maintaining of the separateness, which is required for the weavings. Um, this is called Val. I still owe you a birthday gift, that one unfilled small promise to brush your white hair, peel a ripe pomegranate, engrave a crescent moon in the molted reddened rind, break it open with my teeth before we wash our shoulders, our faces in its tender bleeding. So many conversations these days are of what we cannot have. Yes, and of course of what we do, how the bedsheet smell of milled slumber, surrendered remembrances of our own skin and sweat blended with the others, the ones who keep us in time. How like worn rags, once used for polishing antiquated silver, we will ring this terrible year out until we shine. Our bodies ornaments, gleaming celebratory fruits. We, all of us. I still owe you that old birthday gift to realize what's unfulfilled, my vow to brush your winter hair, test its unexpected weight, those drifts like hardy wild grasses, we could build houses of substantial, thick, spilling over my hands until the rhythm of what is braided, one, two, three, repeatedly grows, circles merging together, the past, the present, the future, that heavy and luxurious fabric. And then um, a love poem for Adrian, Netsuke, which is both about together and 
not. Natsuke. And in the morning, a Natsuke sculpture, two figures cocooned, fastened into a rare container, twins reciting the blue scriptures of being both roots, turning the pages of dawn, curving the lathe of form, one to the other, before the land spirits disappear, hiding from daybreak before the slight stirring of silence breaks open, willingly unfolded, exposed, before all the doors swing wide and the dreams of running away fade, while the peach tulips ease from the cold winter night, before the red tail comes to bathe, before hunger makes my love rise and barefoot walk the scarred pine floors before coffee with turmeric, wildflower, honey, before all the gardeners arrive, before the roar of cars, before the world is hot wired, before we recall we can't live far from the sea, but we don't, nor far from the trees, and we don't, before the light of the morning candle is doused as the joined moments fade before we meet the finish line of slumber and fully wake, rising as whole and separate people. Oh, thank you, Holiday. It was so beautiful. beautiful. Magnificent. Beautiful. Thank thank you too. Uh, spectacular. Wowie, zowie, zowie, zowie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So it's funny that we both unplanned each read a poem that uh, came from a prompt. The prompt was also, in fact, a text from Holiday in which she said, I owe you a hairbrushing and a pomegranate. So that is one way in which we have collaborated. Uh, we share a prompt and all three of us sometimes will include other poets. Um, Iris Cushing has participated mm -hmm. um, in create. We each create a poem from this prompt. Sometimes they remain separate. Sometimes we do uh, afterwards braid them together. And um, we may do that just literally one, two, three, the way you would braid hair, or we might use uh, a randomizing um, generator to just bring them together somehow mm -hmm. uh, that we then edit and we'll take turns editing. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of ways that we work together. Sometimes we'll sit at the table and actually write um, at the same time on, on the same work that we then braid. Mm -hmm. We've gotten to a thing where every New Year's we would write a poem together, a mm -hmm. big collaborative poem, and that was very fun. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, three poems to read uh, that are collab collaborations, and Holiday will begin with one. They were all probably done with different methods, but um, it's very joyful to add our voices together and have them result in this, in this um, other voice, which is not exactly any one of us, yet shares things of, that from each. Mm -hmm. Okay. Holidays, you want to start? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I would just say, which maybe we, you said it, um, I don't know who wrote what, I have no clue. I have no recollection whatsoever. Um, so Venice is changing. I'm prying my thighs from the Naga hide seats at La Cabana and Rose and Lincoln. <laughs> Sorry. <There's> a... <laughs> yeah, we all can relate to that. There's a wedge of brie in my handbag. I wear a big gold wedding ring, but it's somebody else's. I have two diamond rings. I don't know whose they are either. I was thinking when I was peeing, I can build a house using one squirt gun and a stick of gum and a lollipop. There's a language of parasols. And what that woman just said was filthy. There's a drawer full of dead mice in my pants. How do I say that in parasol? Over to you, my love. Fabulous. <laughs> Someone we once knew, Corazon Negra. A woman is going to come into the door, not through the door, mind you, but into the door. The woman is a kind of door. When she enters, dust leaves the room. A woman is going to grab the doorknob and her noisy welcome expands, knocks over a white plastic Buddha. Her zipper's missing teeth leave her like a song with vanished notes asleep on its way upward. 
She writes something on bamboo. The bamboo makes a tent around shadows, like the size or shape of spaces between doors that only the wind can enter. Still, she finds that orange peels on a table retain some perfume regardless, the tents full of whispers. The woman's hair loves and hates the door and the hinges that have just been replaced with wind. The in-betweens fill up with wind, but no men. Here comes another woman. Radios compete for her fingers, her ears. Whoever she was, or perhaps is, the soothing judo she uses when folding means I am awake and breathing and keeping blankets to myself, away from those who would cheat me out of a dip in the river that was rising like steam or a kite or the lead foot of a defunct god into the picture puzzle streets. The last 40 years were never more than shadows. A woman is going to come into the door not through the door, mind you, but into the door, as I suppose one comes into money or comes into a bed of blue roses or comes into the realization that to write something is to cradle what you lost when you arrived and when you left. She may ask you this. I suggest you tell her the truth. Here's another um, collaboration I, I'm as I recall, the, 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 the three of us contributed more or less equally to this one. Um, this is called In the Sack House. Women these days have the better ideas, the wider vision. Their towns lie rich with triggering warnings. And there on the table is a dead cranberry. I tried to throw the jing but lost one coin. Our oven, with his tongue hanging out, can't hear you when the water's running. Another four hours and we'll sound completely innocent. The exploded night has taken over the plans. Major appliances? I can't. <laughs> They're very fun. They all have a humorous element, I've got to say. Not every time, but often. Well, and 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 if uh, if one if one knows the, the 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 people that one is collaborating with, and and, and I say this to anyone who is who is thinking of of, of doing collaborations yourself, uh, if you know uh, your 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 collaborator and something about your collaborator's mind, uh, uh, you'll be able to see potentially the way an image or a situation can develop. That that uh, that that the that the other person could continue, so that you so and that you can can you continue it too, even though you don't necessarily know specifically which direction it will go into, because there's a certain area of trust that go, that goes uh, that goes on there. So so I I, uh, I find the experience of, of of collaborating on poems gives me that wonderful surprise. That for me is the essence of, of, of any artistic creation, literature, visual art, music, whatever, the, 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 the sense that, that, the, that, uh, that the world is greater than, than, my, than, 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 my, than my mind sense of it. Which I think kind of segues nicely into some thinking that we, we were doing about, you know, what are collaborations? Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I think, you know, I'm collaborating with myself when I take a four page not working prose poem and I whack it into a little narrative poem. So, but in terms of working with other people, um, it certainly the element of trust and play is enormous, right? And, you know, the voices will affect each other. And um, I mean, there are different, there are different structurings. And in terms of what, we have done, I mean, there's some stuff like the braided poems where they're literally, I, I, like I said, I have no recollection who wrote, I don't know. There's stuff I go, hmm, well, hmm, oh, I don't know. You know, with Sarah and I, that was a call and response, but I do know that what was happening in the energy was influencing the generation of the work. And that happens a great deal uh, with the visual work. And I hope you guys will please go and have a look at the show um, 
that show is a collaboration in that the images, even though most of them are created individually, they have talked to each other because we talk to each other about one another's work all the time. There's a kind of natural cross pollinating. Then there are images that are really quite literally um, elements are taken from one medium and then migrate into another. For example, Celeste is going to show you some stuff on screen. Um, the crone hair material, which um, just started because we have this hair and there's light and I take pictures. So um, we, we sometimes can't even tell who's who. I happen to know it's me because my ring is there, but and I don't think you were putting it on, but I don't know who it is, right? Then Celeste took the crone hair and started to collage it into other places like Musso and Frank's over a martini, you know, that kind of thing, or whatever those images are working in that way. So uh, uh, things happened in that way and happen in that way. Then she started making sculptures. This is a sculpture she was inspired to, to make. And I looked at it and I said, okay, that sculpture is called Time. And I wanted to migrate this into all kinds of different um, locations, which we then went ahead and did. This is a Thanksgiving dinner um, where um, my, uh, my signature nudes are there. I'm in a black um, veil over here. Um, and there's a folded American flag and a decimated dinner on paper plates. Um, this was our actual Thanksgiving dinner. So that's how, <laughs> that's how a lot of these things happen. And then we did some series, which I don't think we have images of called the Nighty, the Nighty Dancers. There's a couple in the show and Celeste, used a lot of those in different paintings, right? They, they migrated over there. So I don't know if I've covered everything that would be helpful or interesting or any of that, but I got nothing else at the moment. Yeah, so so as far as the, um, the ways we collaborated on the visual art, uh, sometimes I'll make a painting that then will become a prop that Holiday uses in a photograph um, if you've ever seen some of the round mask paintings of mine, um, Holiday has used those. And, and then I might take the image of, let's say Holiday is in her mother's nighty holding up this round mask over her face. There's a photograph of that. I will then cut her out of that and put her into a completely other um, scene. For instance, I have her looking in the window of a bridal shop on a main street of a little town. So we, of course, love the surrealism and collage is a great way to do that. But even in the course of just working together on a shoot, we all contribute ideas and it's very fluid um, to come up with these various, uh, various strange combinations. But, there, there's a photograph in the show uh, of, uh, of, of me in a, in, a, in a suit sitting next to uh, a, a very attractive young woman with long dark hair wearing, wearing a, 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 a skirt and blouse. And, and, um, and we're both holding large uh, white stripes of cardboard over our mouths. And, and, and I, I, as, as, as I recall, Holiday, uh, the big pieces of cardboard were were your idea, but they were your pieces of cardboard. Right, and we, and we never imagined they would be used that large. Yeah. We were going to cut them down into small sizes. Go holiday. I, I wanted to do those because I got really pissed off at Instagram, which, because I couldn't show nipples, <laughs> right? This made me really mad. So I said, can I say fuck on this thing? Well, whatever. I, <laughs> So I said, forget it, man. We're going to cut those big pieces so I could do what I wanted to do and cover things. And then we'd cover the mouth and then it became kind of iconic. That's a series that is not completed yet. It's clear to me there's more free the nipples. Jonathan Maul. Yeah, free the nipples. <laughs> All right, free Jonathan Maul. Right. I mean, so, you know, things morph from 
sometimes like edges create, you know, it's like pearls. So yes, in, mm -hmm. in point of fact, that- yeah. And maybe I thought, um, Jim, you'd like to say something about your texts that you created for the, for the pieces. Cause um, if you've looked at them, you'll see the, mm. the surprising and um, mm -hmm. enriching, I might say, uh, text that goes along with each image in the show. Well, well, well it, it, um, uh, it struck me that, um, that giving a descriptive um, caption was, was, was utterly pointless. Uh, and that, and that, that, um, that uh, what, what could be, what could be more interesting was if I took each of these images in more or less the same way I would take uh, a, a, a verbal image that had been given me in a, in a, in a poem prompt. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is to, 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 to take this image, see what it suggests and develop the suggestion in a certain way. Uh, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then leave the development in a in, in a more or less, you know, becoming embryonic way, uh, so that uh, that it could be continued, you know, by 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 someone else. So 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 for instance, in the, in, the, in the picture that I that I um, that I made reference to, uh, with um, with the with 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 the, the the young woman and me with with the, with the with the um, uh, with the uh, nipple concealers over our mouths, mm -hmm. um, uh, my my uh, my um, uh, my paragraph had to do with uh, with things that were concealed behind the background mm -hmm. in the photograph, not not with anything that was that was that was visible, because I thought that was another way that you could develop that mm -hmm. was what was by looking at what's there or what's not there. And he wrote the titles as well. Um, I wrote the titles as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Uh, I have I would like to admit that that started from laziness or disinclination to title one's artwork, which is always a challenge. If there any artists on the call, they know that. Um, but I don't know what Holiday and I imagined, perhaps lyrical, luscious descriptions of the artwork. Uh, but whatever we imagined, we were we were surprised and and excited and charmed by where where he went with it. And it was a great example of the of the way collaborations veer off into directions you had no idea. Well, the the, the photographs are lyrical, lush descriptions of 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 of, of the mind of the person already. They, they they don't need any more. You know, the 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 um, um, the sugar lumps don't need to be dipped in honey. Okay. Um, Alda, anything else there? I I don't have anything else. If anybody wants to chime in i know nobody can talk it's always the strangest thing to read to no if sense. there are if there are questions put them yeah. in the chat i've scanned back and i don't see questions per se except right. how do i say that in parasol and i, I can't help you there right but it, it, it's uh, sort of like this <laughs> now, that brings us to the i think center. it has to do with, with with how one holds the parasol perhaps like semaphore yeah right right like, oh, like, yeah. like, like, yes. like this or like this or like that Okay. One, one means come hither, yeah. one means go away. Oh, I was just going to say that we also do have a video that we created um, with the help of a, a videographer. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Suzanne Lamas has, a, has, has, a, has an excellent practical question. How much longer is the show going to be up? Until May 28th. May 28th, okay, so yep. another month. Yep, another month. and if, if anyone on this call has not seen the, the um, or has not contributed to the group poem, please cons uh, consider doing that. Sure. I think that'd be great fun. And yes, there is a video and it's called uh, Dragging Time. And um, it was uh, improvised at holidays in her garden with one of those sculptures. Um, there were originally three sculptures, one seated in lotus position, one seated in a chair and one standing. We had to break the standing one to get it to sit down at Thanksgiving for that other shot. We drag them on top of mountains. We we uh, we drag them everywhere. So and then we cut the head off of one. Oh right, we cut the, finally cut the head off one. Finally to dispose of it. And there's a fantastic video, honestly, of Cushing, um, uh, uh, sitting in front of a. What did you have? An image of and, and he's talking. There's a, over the time video. So that there's a lotus time. And oh, I remember that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It's a crazy video. Yeah. Yep. 
Great. So anyhow, um, are we able to show the video that we have on the on the thing now, or 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 do you, or or do you have to go to the show to, to see? Yeah, it? you do. It's on the Beyond Baroque page with the show on it. If you scroll oh, down, you have to go to the show to get it. Right, and you can view the show by the way either as the PDF. Yeah. Um, which will enable you to navigate around room to room and zoom in on each image, kind of in a more fluid way as though you were walking in a gallery. Um, go to a uh, view full screen, whatever program you're watching, looking at the PDF in, and then it'll work as it was intended. You can also just view it as a, a slideshow, which goes um, room, detail shot of the three images in the room, and then to the next room. But we decided to just do it that way so you have options. But the video, the link to the video and the link to the group poem are all on that on that page. So I think that's all we have. Oh, here's a question. Oh, goody. Mm -hmm. Is the title of the exhibition a reference to the stylist's quote or just a coincidence? I have found my subjects within 60 yards of my door. Uh, it's a, it's no, a, but it's a wonderful quote. It's a beautiful coincidence, Sherry. Yes. It's, 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 um... But that, that does bring up another um, point that we didn't raise before, and that is that we did answer three questions each about the show. So it's three questions by the three of us, and that's hosted on our website. So you can see it at CelesteGoyer.com or JamesCushingPoetry.com or on Holiday site as well. And it was fun to, to do that too. Why do I think of the only a few yards away I had to do uh, correct me Celeste I don't remember this is how this goes but I think it's be, was taken from my series things on the ground which are uh, basically still life um, abstract but they're of garbage and whatever and that started because of a handicap so I always have to look down when I'm walking I, I can't take a step without knowing where I'm gonna step and that then, I think you came up with only it, only a few yards away, which is a super cool thing. Which, I, go ahead. Go ahead. And then someone else pointed out that to them, it seemed like only a few backyards away because some of the images were in fact taken in backyards. So, and isn't that how it is in the suburbs? You always have this sort of creepy feeling that things are going on in backyards you can't really understand, mm -hmm. but you maybe don't want to. Right. So, uh, A.R. Wyatt says, the show theme is quite interesting. Maybe you can discuss that. I, I can't without lipstick. <laughs> mm. Well, there is a bit of a conversation about right. that in the, the questions that we yeah. sort of self-interviewed right. that you can see on our websites. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's also, um, well, the theme mm -hmm. itself, I mean, the, there isn't really quote unquote a hard and fast mm -hmm. theme. I would say that Holiday and I work in sort of the same areas of, of interpretation and exploration um, along the lines of feminine experience, um, aging, what else Holiday, surrealism. Feminine. So I think what we also are very interested in is um, that which is taboo in terms of uh, grief and the blood mysteries, women, um, aging for sure, um, the, the relationship of the body with obviously the natural world and time, we're poets, you know, time and death and, but a lot around aging and absolutely surrealism. And uh, my Red Veil series is all about uh, blood and birth and life force like that. And sex, of course. Never, ever to forget that. Um, so. Okay. So, anything else? Um, I think that about wraps it up. Here it is, six o'clock. Yeah. And I, if we're done, I think we'll throw it back to Quentin. And with thanks once again to Beyond Baroque. Yes. To Quentin, Jimmy, and Jody for helping set up mm -hmm. the kind of complex uh, uh, show setup that we created. And to all of you for coming and for the poetry community in Los Angeles for being so wonderful and supportive. Yes. Yes, this has been one of the one of the shortest hours of, of, of the year so far. And I, and I want to thank everyone for, for, for participating in it and for um, and, 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 and please, please, um, if you haven't seen the show, um, uh, uh, take a look at it and, and, and let, the, let the images 
um, enter your your waking and dreaming life. And thank you to Holiday Mason as well, because uh, she invited me into the into the family of artists there at the Wild Working in a wonderful way, and uh, well, it's changed my life. We met. I said, "Do you want to shoot?" And she said, "Yeah." That was it. <laughs> Meet Holiday. You're going to take your clothes off sooner or later and be in front of a camera. It's a good uh, thing. <laughs> you're going to have flowers stuck in your hair or something. That's right. Proud to be a member of Beyond Baroque. Yes, yeah. Beyond Baroque. Yep. Send money hey. to Beyond Baroque. Thank, thank you, Holiday. Thank you, Jim and Bye. Celeste. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I really hope everyone will go and check out the show. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we miss you seeing you in person, but um, this is just this has just been a, a total delight. So uh, bye from all of us here at Beyond Baroque. Um, thanks again to our artists, as they said as well. Thanks to Jimmy Vega, who's behind the scenes, and uh, Jody Zellen, who is our webmaster and uh, put the show up online. And yes, um, onwards to the next. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much.